the Suez Canal, vital passageway between the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean, once one of the busiest shipping routes in the world. Then, in June 1967, in the Egyptian-Israeli Six-Day War, closed to all trade by ordnance and by ships scuttled at various points along the canal. The result? A worldwide loss in trade and increased shipping costs totaling $1.7 billion a year. But in January 1974, at the conclusion of another outbreak of hostilities, a new agreement between Egypt and Israel places the canal once again under Egyptian control. And by March, the Egyptian government is ready to proceed with plans for reopening the entire 101-mile waterway to international shipping. Early in 1974, in the belief that reopening the Suez Canal would restore more stable conditions in the Middle East, the United States government agrees to fund the clearance effort. Gentlemen, the Egyptian government has formally asked the United States to assist them in funding for the clearance of the Suez Canal. The State Department has requested the Navy to undertake the task, and the Navy has elected to assign the task to the supervisor of salvage for accomplishment using commercial salvers. The operational responsibility for removing the 10 largest wrecks is assigned to the United States Navy Supervisor of Salvage, Captain J. H. Boyd, Jr. We intend to use our standing salvage contract with Murphy Pacific. Gentlemen, we've officially received word from the Navy Department to go ahead with the wreck removal project in Suez and they've tasked us to proceed as rapidly as possible. The Navy, in turn, calls upon its principal salvage contractor, the Murphy Pacific Marine Salvage Company, to do the job. And while it's rather sketchy, uh, I think it would be advisable, uh, Captain Matteo, if you gave us a brief review of uh, the information that you have about the wrecks. The project manager for Murphy Pacific, Joseph F. Matteo, uh, Jr. The canal is divided into three sections north, central, and southern. In the northern area, the first wreck is uh, that of the small cargo ship, Ismailia, about in the center of the canal, sitting upright. About a half mile to the south is the passenger cargo ship, Mecca, lying on its side, essentially 7,300 tons, the largest wreck in the canal. Moving south, the first wreck is the dredge 23, a uh, bucket dredge of about 1,600 tons, and actually lying more uh, on its side in a 90-degree angle. It's about a 135-degree angle. South of Lek Timsa was probably the most effective, or is probably the most effective wreck in the canal, the uh, Tug Mongod and the dredge Kassa. Further on south, in the uh, regular cut of the canal, is the concrete case on 3,800 tons of reinforced concrete lying on its side. At the entrance to the canal from the Great Biddle Lake is the dredge 15 September, and this uh, wreck has been designated by the Suez Canal Authority as the only one worthy of being salved instead of just removed. Moving into the southern area, the first wreck is the tanker Mag, a 3,400-ton tanker lying on its side, uh, presumably laden with uh, silt and other debris because it has been reported as being extensively damaged by explosives. To the south of it is the Tug Barra. The Tug Barra is uh, sitting on the slope of the canal, 
and is reportedly loaded with explosives as it sank before it could be effectively scuttled. Just south of it is the dredge 22, which is similar to the 23, also lying on its side. Our salvage plan, as I see it, is to start the cutting up process in the north while awaiting the arrival of the lift craft from the south and the cranes from the north. Before the salvers arrived at the Suez, the canal was swept for mines by the U.S. Navy using helicopter mine countermeasure procedures. Unexploded ordnance was removed from the canal, and the wrecks themselves were checked by explosive ordnance disposal personnel. By the time the first contingent of salvers arrived on the scene on May 27th, they had approval from the Suez Canal Authority to proceed with work on the two wrecks in the northern sector. And within two days, divers were at work and cutting was underway on the first wreck. Meanwhile, the men and equipment necessary for accomplishing the salvage plan were on the move toward Suez, along with the specialized lifting equipment required for the task. Two primary craft called upon were the Crilly and the Crandall, U.S. Navy-owned yard heavy lift craft the world's largest lift craft. Each one is capable of lifting 2,400 tons in the ballast lift mode, so that together, the two craft can lift a total of 4,800 tons. Also, in order to complete the clearance by the end of the year, as called for in the salvage plan, two seagoing cranes were contracted for the project from the German salvage firm of Bugsier of Hamburg. The Roland, and the Thor could each lift 500 tons on an A-frame, or 1,000 tons using the A-frame plus deck tackle. But there was a lot to be done before the lift craft and cranes arrived in the Suez. In order to use these costly and efficient craft economically, the salvers would have to be ready for them. Work had begun in the northern sector on the wrecks Mecca and Ismailia and it had been determined that the most practical technique for removal would be to section the wrecks into pieces, which could be lifted and removed by the heavy lift equipment. Of the two wrecks, Mecca was a much larger and more complex ship. After removal of the superstructure to the promenade deck, she would be cut into 14 sections, each one sized for lifting by a 500-ton crane. Ismailia was a smaller, simpler ship, which had been undergoing scrapping before she was sunk. She would be cut into five sections, and therefore represented an excellent opportunity to perfect the underwater cutting techniques which were planned for use on Mecca. And so, efforts on Mecca were concentrated on removal of the superstructure. This was cut off in 15 pieces and carried away by an 80-ton capacity Canal Authority crane which was assigned to support the salvage operation. Also at this time, the hull was searched for any remaining fuel oil, and some 40,000 gallons of Bunker C were pumped from the ship's tanks into a waiting barge. At the Ismailia, divers were at work extracting some 2,800 tons of mud, which had collected inside the hull, and underwater cutting of the Ismailia's hull began. Explosive cutting was used extensively on Ismailia and Mecca. Oxyarc cutting was used underwater to score the cut line, and then final severance was accomplished with explosive charges. The charges were C4 explosive, packed into two-inch angle sections or split fire hose. Explosive services were provided by Technical Explosives Incorporated of Harvey, Louisiana. Engineering support throughout the project, including assistance in planning the sectioning of the hulls, was provided by Ocean Oil International Engineering Corporation of New Orleans. And the divers were supplied by the experienced salvage diver firm of Buck Steber Incorporated of Bell Chase, Louisiana. By the end of June, the 24-man salvage force now on the scene had disposed of the superstructure of the Mecca and had cut the Ismailia into five pieces, ready for the heavy lift craft when they came. By this time, 
Authority had been given by the Suez Canal Authority to proceed with work on the rest of the wrecks. And so the salvers were split into two teams. One, an explosive cutting team that remained to section the Mecca, and the other, a survey team to investigate and report on the rest of the wrecks. The survey team, using the Canal Authority's 25-ton self-propelled crane barge Bayumi, fitted out with the necessary diving equipment and machinery, proceeded southward from wreck to wreck, gathering the information needed for the removal operations to follow. By the end of July, the survey was complete, and the team was reorganized into a trim and rig team assigned to prepare the wrecks for the heavy lift equipment so that it could be put to work as soon as it arrived at the wreck site. This meant removing any protrusions that might foul the lift wires or lift craft. Quantities of burning rod were consumed in cutting away booms, davits, masts, funnels, and other objects on the wrecks. The trim and rig team also removed mud from the hulls to lighten the wrecks and ran messenger wires under the hulls in preparation for the lifting or writing wires to come. One trim and rig job on the tanker mag presented some special challenges to the salvers. For one thing, the mag had to be cut into two pieces for lifting. In addition, it was found that a swift and unpredictable tidal current prevailed at times in the area. This current was so swift and irregular that diving could not be planned. The solution? Coffer dams, fabricated of three-foot diameter pipe, rigged from the surface to the hull, through which the divers could enter the ship without being exposed to the turbulent current. Alongside the coffer dam access holes, other holes were cut for airlift discharges. There was an unusually large amount of silt in the mag, which had to be removed to cut down on weight and allow access for cutting the hull in half. As soon as access to the hull was established, cutting began using oxyar. At the same time, wires were rigged under the stern for par buckling. And when the section cut had been completed, messenger wires were run under the bow section in preparation for the bug's ear cranes. Lifting operations began with the arrival of the bug's ear salvage crane Thor at Suez in the middle of August. Thor moored over the Ismalia and rigged its wires for a lift on the bow section of the wreck. The bow section was lifted and held by the crane as it was towed to the designated dry dump area. Here would be the final destination for 5,500 tons of scrap from the Mecca and Ismalia. Thor continued to work in the northern sector, removing the remaining pieces of the Ismalia and the Mecca from the wreck site to the dump area. Also in August, the two heavy lift craft, Crilly and Crandall, arrived at the southern end of the canal and were moved into position in the central area. Their first assignment was to raise the mongo, a tug, which lay almost upright. By using the wire messengers positioned by the trim and rig team, the heavy lift wires were pulled under the tug and made fast. The heavy lift craft, or YHLCs, can operate in two basic modes, ballast lift and dynamic lift. Their greatest lifting power is generated in the ballast lift mode, and this is how they lifted the tug Mongood. The YHLCs are positioned one on each side of the wreck, and several sets of wires are rigged under the wreck. The wires are run in pairs from the inboard side of one craft to the outboard side of the other and vice versa. Then the YHLCs are ballasted down. The slack is taken out of the wires and they are pinned down. Finally, as the YHLCs deballast, they rise slowly in the water and the lift is made with the wreck slung on a cradle of wires between the two craft. After a preliminary trial lift, the Mongood was lifted to a keel depth of 16 meters moved 20 meters away from the hole it was in, and grounded. On the third lift, the move toward the dump area began. The lift craft were towed, one tug ahead, one behind, to the dump area in Great Bitter Lake, 
where the mongoo was deposited. After leaving Mongood at the dump site, Crilly and Crandall were towed back up the canal and moored in position over the dredge casser. Seventeen lift wires were passed under the wreck and attached to the lift craft. On the first lift, it was raised and moved 50 meters. Then on the next lift, the wreck and lift craft were towed to the Great Bitter Lake and Kasser was deposited 200 yards from Mongoo. While Krilly and Crandall were engaged with Kasser, Thor had been joined by the second Bugsier crane, Roland. Now they were assigned to leave their work on the Mecca temporarily and move down to Parbuckle the Dredge 23, a job for which they were better suited than the heavy lift craft. Once they had righted the dredge, then Krilly and Crandall could move it out of the canal. Thor and Roland, which are technically derricks, are constructed with a shear leg type A-frame on the bow. There are two hooks in the A-frame, each attached to a set of six-fold purchases with a lifting capacity of 250 metric tons, a total of 500 tons which are available for lifting an object out of the water. In addition, there are two sets of deck tackle which can be rigged through bow rollers to provide another 250 metric tons of lift each. The main lifting hooks can work together with the deck tackle to give each crane a total capacity of 1,000 metric tons in cases where an object does not have to be lifted clear of the water. Thor and Roland began by working together on the south side of dredge 23, but in this position they were unable to right it because of the dredge's deteriorated hull condition. And so Roland was moved to the other side for a direct lift on the dredge's gantry. The dredge was easily righted and left for removal by Krilly and Crandall. While Thor and Roland went back to work on Mecca, Krilly and Crandall, in an almost routine operation, moved over the dredge 23 and picked it up. In three lifts, the dredge was moved into the dump area and placed between Mongood and Kasser. Meanwhile, in the northern zone, with Thor and Roland working together, a decision had been made to accelerate the operation by eliminating three of the 13 cuts planned for the Mecca and to have Thor and Roland lift double sections together. This saved valuable diver time in making the cuts and reduced the number of sections to be lifted and moved. A wet dump area was designated in the north for the double sections. In some instances, two cranes were required to lift a section to the bank. In others, such as this section of Mecca, which elongated due to structural weakness, further cutting was accomplished at the dump site. Lifting of both single and double sections of the Mecca went routinely up to the last of the large double sections. But on this one, the side plating structure was too weak to support the lifting chains. To lighten the load, the salvage team set to work removing two decks by cutting them in small pieces. While this was being done, Roland lifted the final section of Ismalia into the dry dump area. Then Thor and Roland moved south to help with the other wrecks. Their first task was to remove the dredge 22 from the southern end of the canal. After parbuckling, the lift was made, with the two cranes positioned on opposite sides of the wreck and rigged for their full capacities. With both main hooks and deck tackles working, the dredge 22 was carried down the canal and deposited in the wet dump area south of the southern entrance to the canal. Next came the tug bearer. Thor and Roland moved to the site and moored over the wreck. Again. Each crane was made up in the full capacity 1,000 ton lift mode. The total of 2,000 tons lift capacity proved more than adequate. Barrow was lifted, transported to the southern dump area, and placed on the bottom. The last wreck in the southern zone was the tanker Mag, which had been cut into two pieces earlier by the trim and rig team. 
Thor and Roland began by turning the stern section upright. Then they moved into position side by side, re-rigged for lifting and raised the stern off the bottom. Then, en route to the dump area, the wreck unexpectedly hit an uncharted high point on the canal bottom that had developed since 1967. Roland lurched forward, separating from Thor as her lift tackle parted. Thor grounded on the wreck itself and had to be freed, and the damaged rigging repaired. Finally, after two days of hard work, the cranes and the wreck were rigged for lifting once again, and the stern section of Mag was on the way to the dump site. The cranes returned to the Mag wreck site where they parbuckled the bow section into an upright position. Then they lifted and carried the hulk to join its other half in the dump area. With the dumping of the bow and stern sections of the mag in the Gulf of Suez, the southern zone of the canal had been completely cleared, and Thor and Roland headed northward to the dredge 15 September. The 15 September was the one vessel the Suez Canal authorities wanted salvaged if feasible. Damage was thought to be light and the dredge was destined for refurbishing and reuse. It had been sunk by opening the sea suction valves rather than by explosives, and the main problem would be to turn the hull upright without damaging it. To this end, chafing plates were installed to prevent the parbuckling and lifting wires from cutting into the hull. After rigging their wires, Thor and Roland parbuckled the dredge into an upright position. Then they were used to raise the wreck to a point where it could be pumped dry and floated. As soon as the wreck was lifted above the surface, silt and marine growth were washed off with pressure hoses. Debris was removed to lighten the hull, and the dredges after ballast tanks were blown with air. Pumping was started as soon as a portion of the main deck was above the surface of the water. This combination of lifting, pumping, and blowing refloated the dredge 15 September. It was towed to the shipyard in Ismailia for renovation. Thor and Roland returned to the north end of the canal and their final lift of the clearance operation. They raised the last double section of the Mecca from the bottom of the canal and removed it to the wet dump area. Removal of the last piece of the Mecca completed operations in the northern zone and the work of Thor and Roland in the Suez. Meanwhile, Crilly and Crandall were at work on their final task, which proved to be one of the more difficult jobs in the entire operation. Removal of the 3,800-ton concrete caisson, which lay across the canal midway between Lake Timsa and Great Bitter Lake. The salvage plan called for the damaged caisson to be removed in two pieces, and the trim and rig team had made the cut with extreme difficulty. But before a lift could be attempted, the west end of the caisson had slid down into a depression caused by scouring of the canal bottom and tunneling by the divers. The hole was so deep that the section could not be lifted clear of it by the tidal ballast men. As a result, the western end of the caisson had to be cut into smaller pieces which could be lifted one at a time. To avoid endangering the divers, the caisson was cut horizontally from the outside using explosives and oxy -arc. The resulting pieces were removed by the YHLCs using the dynamic stern lift mode. In the dynamic stern lift mode, the YHLC is positioned with its stern gantry crane over the object to be lifted. Each crane is rigged with a set of six-fold purchases providing a 150-ton lift capability. This capacity can be doubled 
by running the lift wire around under the wreck over stern rollers to a set of 150-ton deck purchases. Since there are two gantry cranes on each craft and two deck tackles, the total dynamic stern lift capability of each YHLC is 600 tons. This is how Crilly and Crandall were rigged for a dual stern lift on the remainder of the western end of the concrete caisson. They lifted it out of the hole and set it down on the canal bottom at normal depth. The two heavy lift craft then moved into position for a side ballast lift of the eastern portion of the caisson. This section came up well and was moved in three lifts as far as the Deversoir Causeway, which had been built across the canal just above Great Bitter Lake. Two more lifts took it across the causeway and into the final dump position. The time had come for the final obstruction to be cleared from the canal. Crilly and Crandall were returned to the western section of the caisson where they were rigged for side lift. This time, the hulk came up as planned and the final piece of the caisson was on its way to the dump site. With the concrete caisson at rest in the Great Bitter Lake, all ten wrecks had been removed. The clearance of the Suez Canal was complete. It was December 19th. The clearance had been completed ahead of schedule, with no serious problems or accidents. It had been a classic wreck removal operation, with a full share of difficulties. Old wrecks of many different types, some notoriously difficult to remove, and about which in most cases little was known, some made even more hazardous by the presence of unexploded ordnance. And yet, the project had gone smoothly and expeditiously. On June 5th, 1975, at the official opening ceremonies at Ismailia, Egypt, the Suez Canal was once again open to international traffic. The first step had been taken toward restoring the Suez Canal to the position it once held of prominence and vital importance in world trade. <laughs>